Welcome to this very first episode of Macrodose Roundtable, the show where we go in depth with some of the brightest minds from the world of economics and ecology. Macrodose Roundtables are an opportunity to expand some of the ideas introduced in our short, sharp 15-minute roundups in a longer-form, multi-guest format. My name is Sarah Jaffe, and I'll be your host for today. I'm an American labor journalist and the author of the book, Work Won't Love You Back. And I'm here today to situate Palestine and the current aggression in the global economy and talk about what the daily economic realities are for the people in Palestine, their work, their access or lack thereof to goods and services and places to live. And I'm going to do that with Lala Khalili, who is a professor of Gulf Studies at the University of Exeter. She is the author of Sinews of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula, which came out in 2020 from Verso, and a new book, The Corporeal Life of Seafaring from Mac Books, coming in February. I'm also joined today by Kareem Rabi, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His work focuses on privatization, urban development, and the state building project in the West Bank. And he's the author of Palestine is Throwing a Party and the Whole World is Invited, which was published by Duke University Press in 2021. <laughs> Um, wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today on Macrodose. Um, hi, Sarah. It's really lovely to be talking to you. Thank you. Thank you to you both. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I wish we were here with the two of you under better circumstances. But um, I have to start out with a terrible, huge, impossible question to answer. But um, can we start with a brief explanation of what settler colonialism looks like today in Palestine, the ways that sort of elimination and exploitation intertwine in Palestinian life? Um, Kareem, do you want to start? Well, I guess for me, talking about settler colonialism in Palestine does does a couple of things. I mean, I think that it it helps draw attention to the wider geographies that are that are sort of impacting life there and how the so-called conflict in Palestine and historic Palestine is being managed. So I think one of the things about, about settler colonialism or the idea of settler colonialism is that it helps show, you know, from the perspective of the state, how the push and pull between territorial control and management work, how subject populations are differently incorporated or separated on the basis of things like labor migration, zones of stability or instability, and forms of aspiration and national identification that are sort of permissible or are restricted at different times and in different places there. Um, the idea of settler colonialism is an old conceptual framework that you know, activists and thinkers and scholars have used uh, for talking about Palestine for, for, for a long time. Um, and I, I've been thinking about it a lot recently now that you know, the language has really stuck in a lot of the, the popular conversation and discourse um, and has also been the subject of sort of weird bad faith or willfully ignorant uh, critiques in places mm -hmm. like the Times and the Atlantic. Yeah. So again, I think what it helps to show are the, the dynamic qualities of, of the settler col colonial process, a process that includes at different times and different places, prohibitions on identity, assimilation, segregation, labor exploitation again, and, and, and also, um, this is very relevant now, its relationship to genocidal violence, right? It's, it's sort of close ties and, and, uh, with with forms of genocidal violence, how they're intertwined and how they impact life there. And then what, what shakes out from that is we can start to to analyze or, or, or sort of properly situate some of the specifics of, of what it looks like there, settler control yeah. and then in, in the West Bank, the Gaza blockade and so on. I kind of want to go in and I, uh, only because recently I have been doing a little bit of research um, really on, on a, very, a very strange little subject, which is um, Israel and uh, energy. So uh, access to oil, ac uh, access to natural gas and, and coal. Um, and one of the things that also becomes very clear is that capital accumulation through extraction is also, has been part of Israeli settler colonialism from, very, from the very, very first. I mean, one of the things that they the, yeah. the uh, uh, Israeli state does after 1948 is to start prospecting for oil everywhere. And in fact, one of the reason, one of the things that happens in the 1956 attack that the Israelis, the French and the British uh, do against Egypt and occupy Sinai, in the, in the short period that Israel occupied Sinai, it actually sent its geologists around looking for oil in Sinai, which it then exploited after it occupied Sinai 
quote unquote, properly from 1967 onwards. And so there's, there is a labor exploitation is enormously central to, 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 to the question of Palestine and has always been. And, and in part, that also sort of forms the basis of thinking about apartheid regimes, regimes of permits and work, uh, et cetera. But I think like all other settler colonialism, there's an element of capital accumulation and exploitation of the natural world um, and of the space also that mm. is central to this. Um, I, for a time, it was about agriculture, obviously. Um, uh, agriculture was such a sort of a huge part of Israeli economy until the 1960s. And then it became about extraction of value from other things. And so I think it's important to also put that massively, actually vulgar economic thing back in the question. Yeah. Because one of the things that we forget is ultimately this, this state has to have an economic basis. And it, where it ex excludes Palestinians from exploitation, it nevertheless tries to extract as much value as it can from, for example, their lands. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just just really briefly. I mean, I think one of the things that it also does is is the the you know the idea of of settler colonialism, or how do I say it? Like there are ideas about the appropriateness of uh, stewardship of the land, who owns the mm -hmm. land, what sort of groups are people, what groups of people are, are are empowered to to own the land, and so this idea also helps to to sort of intertwine the racial imperatives with things like you know. Land ownership, resource right. extraction, things like right. that. They're 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 sort of they're bound from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to get into more detail on all of these questions. But um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, as I think a lot of our listeners probably also have been um, watching the destruction in Gaza in real time on Instagram, is the way that we talk about it as an open air prison um, is really important, but I think has also sort of obscured the way that it was also a beautiful place that had universities and hospitals and a full life, even if people were restricted to this tiny strip of land without a lot of rights to move or leave. It also, um, it looks different than we would probably think of an open air prison is. And so I know, again, this is a huge question, but I'm, um, I want to get a sense a little bit about the economy of Gaza, what people did for a living before they were being completely flattened right now, um, how it was integrated into the broader region, and then also how the separation um, has worked on that. Um, okay, so... Um I think the open air prison, you're right, that has a massive uh, kind of a shortcoming, and that is that it ignores the fact that in this instance, uh, open air prison uh, is really about population management rather than about specifically this being just like a, a, a concentration camp. And, and I think that that is actually really important to put um, uh, a degree of emphasis on, because uh, one of the things that settler colonialism does from the very beginning is about po uh, managing populations uh, through systems of racialization. And these systems of racial creation of hierarchies through which who can live and who is not allowed to live, who can uh, work in particular sectors and who cannot, is actually been enacted in its most extreme form, actually, on, on Palestinians yeah. in Gaza. So before uh, Palestinians in Gaza were cut off from the rest of the area, uh, it, it was uh, obviously an agricultural space. It was, it was enormously important for that. It was also, uh, they uh, had uh, a, a seagoing economy um, in terms of fishing and exploitation of natural resources in the water. But also from the very beginning, Gaza City was actually a very important coastal town. And so it, it did all of the things that towns do. It provided services, it had banking, it had all sorts of other things. And of course, as you mentioned, it, it, it was one of the most, uh, it is one of the most densely populated places on earth, but it is also one of mo the most densely high percentage of people that have very higher degrees and education. And that has been true actually for decades. And I think that that is also something to take account of, because obviously these people were providing education, they were providing services, whether these services were medical or otherwise. Um, it, it obviously had class differences. It also, the, the Gaza Strip itself had cities and it had um, more rural areas, which had agricultural life on them. But as the population inside the Strip increased, obviously that um, the same kind of thing that we're seeing in lots of other places happens, which is that the urban sprawl tends to go in all directions, of course, and, uh, almost uh, 
um, all of that urban uh, density has uh, been raised by Israel or bombed to 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 where if if we uh, if Palestinians want to rebuild on there they would have to raise it down to the ground in order to reconstruct it. Um, but the but the closures that began to be enacted. I mean, there has been degrees of control exercised over uh, Gaza Strip from the moment in 1967 that it was uh, fully occupied by Israel. Um, there have been closures enacted on it uh, that have uh, restricted, that have de developed it. I mean, uh, Sarah Roy wrote a book, I don't know, many decades ago, uh, specifically about uh, the politics of de-development. And Sarah Roy based a lot of her experience on the fact that she'd been a doctor in uh, in Gaza herself. And so I think it's really important to notice that the, 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 the politics of de-development was very spe specifically and explicitly part of what um, Israel did. That meant that, for example, not allowing infrastructures to develop. That meant, for example, connecting uh, vital life-giving infrastructures to the Israeli grid so that Israel could have the ability mm. to shut it down. In fact, Moshe Dayan, I, this is a quote that I always quote, sometimes uh, a few weeks or maybe even a few days after 1967, very explicitly said what we need to do in the occupied territories is connect their electricity to ours because nothing works better in pacifying a population than cutting off their electricity. Electricity. Moshe Dayan said this explicitly in 1967. And so I think that that has been um, happening. And we see it actually um, happening right now yeah. in real time where electricity has been mm -hmm. cut off, water has been cut off. Yoav Galant says that uh, on the very first day that what we need to do is cut off all of their utilities. And for the last six days, we know that their telecommunication systems have been decimated and completely cut off. And so in a way, yeah. that has also been part of the process. It isn't just closure, it is making very explicitly mm -hmm. uh, the population in the Strip dependent on Israeli uh, control over life-giving uh, utilities and infrastructures. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Kareem, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, on the question of the economy, I, I do want to be upfront that I, I've never been to Gaza. I sort of have figured that I would never be able to go, uh, and I don't want to present myself as 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 an expert on on that topic. So, and my work focuses on the West Bank. So I do, in the social sciences, also return to Sarah Roy. You know, Sarah Roy, I think the first piece was in the mid-80s, 86, I think, this was, was when she started writing about it, if not before. Um, and she argues something like the management of Gaza has always been economic, and that uh, at, at a certain point, especially after the first intifada, the approach went from regulating Gaza's economy to disabling it. Right. And so, um, so from regulation to, to disablement. Yeah. So the movement of people and goods are tied to that um, and tied to making it impossible for, for the place to have a functional market economy and how, and she puts this explicitly, uh, Israel transformed the political problem there into a humanitarian one. And that's something right. we also see in the, in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the kind of political economic scaffolding there and the cause of its dysfunction. So through that process, then you get a class structure dependent on wages in Israel, something that's uh, not only easy, easily manipulated, um, but also uh, dries up after the first intifada. Right. Um, you get a lack of investment in industry. Uh, you get uh, sort of export markets closed off through border controls and Israeli prerogative. Uh, producers who are structurally, una structurally and politically unable to negotiate because of s supposedly economic, extra economic political conditions, um, high production costs, and then the sort of immiseration and unemployment that, that, that shakes out from that. I mean, for my work, you know, given that it was situated in the West Bank for many reasons, including the sort of obvious practical difficulties of navigating the real fragmentation of Palestine, um, I sort of preferred to look at economic processes at a more general scale. Um, so what Roy shows us is political manipulation of the economy, delinking of Gaza from the rest of Palestine, from the West Bank, from, from Israel, the maintenance of a non-market territory, and then the consequent destruction of social organization and productive forces uh, at, the, at the scale of, of Gaza. I mean, I, and, and I think on the, on the question of the open air prison, you know, I, I was talking a while back with, um, with uh, the geographer and abolitionist Ruth Wilson Gilmore about this, and, and one of the things that that I think uh, is, is vital to thinking through the comparison um, in places where the comparison works, but also where it chafes. And so uh, it's a good metaphor, I think, for thinking about the really wide social processes entailed in this separation and transformation. Um, but also, uh, as, the, as, as you pointed out, um, in terms of people getting by and having a life there, uh, it yeah. points to the unjustness of legal and e questions of legality and illegality. Um, yeah. 
but also how carcerality is something that's really embedded in people's lives and infrastructures yeah. everywhere. And also, um, and, and in cap and capital, capital accumulation in land, um, and and I think points us towards the potentials for uh, sort of wider abolitionist politics around around yeah. this kind of question. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I always think when I start thinking about that of the infamous comment, I forget who it was, about putting guzzins on a diet, right? The restrictions of the food in and out and that the tunnels that we're hearing about so much right now when they're trying to bomb them, right, are not really used to fight a war so much as they are used to get food in so that people don't starve. And that was before all of this it was, latest round it was of Dove bombardment Weisberg, began. Uh, who was an advisor Thank you, to, yeah. I think, Ariel Sharon or, uh, or, or Netanyahu. Probably. So, yeah. But it was Dov Weisberg who said that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the key points there is also that it's it's just a total lie that Israel hasn't occupied Gaza since 2005. Right. I mean, right. the, the, in, the, in the sense of Israelis occupying sort of homes there, the settlements still being there, maybe. But, you know, every aspect is is management and, and, and controlled uh, at the level of borders, the level of sort of controlling the census and the, the population registry, at the, the level of, you know, what comes in and out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So as you've both already alluded to, right, that Palestine is is totally fragmented and segmented in all of these different ways. And people within each of the different segments have different relationships to work, to the state, to free movement, um, to the ability to own land and homes, um, literally all these different access to the means of making a living. Um, I am one of the things that has haunted me the most about the last few months is the workers from Gaza who had permits to work, who tried to go to work and then were sent back with plastic tags on them. Um, and I still am by that. But right, so we're seeing work permits canceled. We're seeing all of these, um, again, these, these um, the, the ability to make a living being shut down in all these different ways. But I wonder if um, you can talk about the different ways that people are able to work or not and own property or not, and how Gaza and the West Bank get played off against each other in this process. Um, so, Kareem, I'm, I'm going to you first on this one. You know, I mean, I think that this is this is related uh, very directly to, to sort of what we've talked about before, and and what um, what Lale just mentioned is that it's it's really important to think about how these territories and these forms of management are linked. These this is about population and territorial management um, link linked at the sort of scale of state management. You know, there's, there are different kinds of dependence for different people at different times. You know, there's there's the opening and closing of, of work permits. There's different kinds of dependence on, on aid, on the PA and so on. I mean, people do move, I, I'm talking about the West Bank here, you know, people do move back and forth, but that's that's a tap that can be closed off, um, closed yeah. off very, very, very easily. I mean, if you geographically look at uh, the West Bank uh, and and the ways in which, uh, the, again, the management of population and territory with Kerry, which Kerry mentions, is actually can be mapped very very easily. You you do see essentially an archipelago of areas that are controlled supposedly mm -hmm. by the Palestinian Authority, which acts as a subcontractor to the Israeli security establishment. Uh, it collects rubbish and it essentially arrests people on behalf of Israel, is what it does. Um, and 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 these areas. As, as Karim said, could shut down. And then when you saw, um, I don't know, it was, it was the Gallant plan for uh, Gaza. It looked exactly like that. Again, an archipelago of places mm -hmm. where populations were going to be densely uh, penned in inside Gaza if they were not going to be sent out into the Sinai. Uh, and, um, and, and, the, and again, controlled completely and totally and utterly there. And I think that that kind of an element of territorial fragmentation and differing and varying and variable regimes of control over where people can go, like the multiplicity of permits you have to get, the, the sort of the, the nightmare of administrative control that you have to navigate mm -hmm. in order to be able to do something as basic as going to school or going to work or uh, going to your field or to the doctor uh, yeah. is, is precisely 
precisely a method of contro uh, colonial control that has been perfected in times of extremely cruel counterinsurgency. I mean, um, plus, of course, settler colonial states do this. So, I mean, there are so many similarities to apartheid South Africa that is just astonishing. You know, the creation of townships, except the townships as they are imagined in, the pa in Palestine, uh, in, in the West Bank or in Gaza, are, are, are teeny. They're, they're about this big. Um, or the imagination of permit regimes where you get to work in certain places, you're not allowed to work in certain places, which allows a degree of control over what labor people can do. Um, access, right. access to medicine or to healthcare are intended to have broader aggregate effects on the population's health as a population and population's education mm. um, and, you know, and, and, and accessibility to labor uh, as a population. So there's a whole lot of really pretty... Um, terrible uh, administrative control, processes of administrative control going on here that have been perfected in hundreds of years of settler colonial racist uh, population management in other continents um, and other places. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in um, 2021 it was, I p covered the general strike in, in Palestine um, that was across all territories that was really um, an incredibly powerful moment. Um, and there have been some strikes happening now, but obviously that's of limited helpfulness when uh, Israel's just canceled a bunch of people's work permits and is not allowing them to work anyway. Um, so again, sort of that backdrop, like how do we understand this kind of thing that a lot of um, <clears throat> certain people on the left would just talk about class struggle in a way that um, I think in a place like this misses the intricacies of how class works in people's lives. Um, that wasn't really a question, but how do we sort of think about class and labor in, in Palestine? I'm large? happy to jump in on this. I mean, if we think about class as articulated through a series of uh, n not simply, the, you know, the sort of the, the extraction of surplus capital, but also as embedded in a whole set of uh, racial uh, hierarchies as well as colonial relations, then then forms of struggle against Israeli colonialism and Israeli colonial control uh, are going to have yeah. this, um, uh, in some places it's going to have labor uh, it, uh, expressions uh, in in the ways in which we recognize general strikes, but in other places it's going to have ex uh, other forms of express uh, expression or appearance. And yeah. I think that it is really really important to acknowledge that uh, that that the sort of the ideal type of labor struggle that, as you say, some on the left kind of idealize, um, actually doesn't even exist in the places that these people base their theories on. Because everywhere that we go, people organize on the basis of the communities that they know, on the basis of the particular very concrete conditions um, in which they're struggling. And so you have the general strike happening in some places when there are moments in which the possibility of strike doesn't end up in you getting uh, imprisoned or killed or worse. Um, but, ra but, but there are other forms of struggle that emerge that will have a class basis if we don't limit class to only that, that thing that happens in the workplace, but rather as, as understanding class to be embedded in these racialized um, colonial relations. No, I mean that's that's exactly right. Is that the the sort of the framework for understanding any of this is the is, in the first instance is the colonial relationship, and so I mean I, I think that in Palestine as everywhere there's huge class stratification, but those discussions have have sort of long been buried as part of the nationalist project or the national project. Right. Um, the idea was kind of that we would deal with the internal problems once the national problems have been settled, um, and you know at least in the West Bank for a lot of people the contradictions have been become pretty difficult to ignore. Um, so you see a lot of cultural critique on the basis of aesthetics, the idea that Ramallah is a bubble. That's sort of what I, one of the things that I was concerned with when I was doing my research. Um, the, the idea that forms of aspiration are counter-national, things like that. Um, you know, and I, 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 when I was doing my, my field research, I talked to rich Palestinians, I talked to middle class or putative middle class Palestinians, I talked to laborers, and the class dimension is there. But again, as, as Lale put very clearly, it's shaped by the relationships to Israeli control and colonization. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, stabilization through accumulation are part of that. Um, you know, engineering a middle class, which is something that I was interested in, is part of that. Um, and again, there as everywhere, class is tied to the wider political economics and historical specifics of the context and the context there is the occupation. Um, yeah. So there are beneficiaries and those are the people who can accumulate, 
who can move, who can get special business permits to cross checkpoints, in some cases work directly with the Israelis. Um, yeah. I mean, on the on the issue of the unions, you know, this isn't really my area of expertise, mm-hmm. but, but I, you know, many of the unions are tied to the PA and tied to Fatah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the way that it's inter- intertwined with life there has, has kind of created problems for organizing because employees are prohibited from demonstrating in a lot of cases. Um, so calls for strikes, I think, often necessarily are then calls against the PA, uh, which makes it which makes it, it sort of quite hard to, to organize them. Um, but it's not just labor unions. I mean, student unions are in, incredibly important sites for organizing in Palestine. Um, they refresh activism and leadership. They create critical organizing against the wider political structures of the of the occupation, including, as as Lale, you know, pointed out, including the PA. Um, you know, and and recently when I was I was talking to to some people in in Domodla who are sort of liberal or liberal left, you know, there's a lot of sort of difficulty and in infighting about how and when to honor the strikes. You know, because mm. uh, you know they're asking questions like should schools and daycares close. Should, you know, should the academic year be canceled? You know, because everybody there is is trying to create some kind of secure and stable life for themselves and their families and their networks. Um, but that, too, is a class specific process. And I think it's important in this instance also to mention the Palestinians inside 48 who are whose ability right. to organize is severely restricted, despite the fact that supposedly they're citizens and enjoy citizen rights. Their ability to actually right. access certain jobs is completely restricted by based on the extent to which they show fealty to the to the state or not. Um, and, and certainly within his Root and other kinds of union uh, organizations, there's very clear hierarchies um, and, and uh, the union of and has bigger attachments to its national uh, sort of Zionist right. um, uh, roots than it does uh, to, to worker solidarity. Right. So inside 48, it's also important right. to note that Palestinians, can, you know, actually they are very heavily uh, represented in the working class and yet their ability to, to sort of organize is curtailed by the fact that union organization there from the very first, in fact, from even before the establishment of Israel, from the moment that the Yishuv emerged, was heavily racialized along the, the sort of the national lines. Right. Right. And just for people who aren't familiar, Histadrut is the Israeli Union Federation, and it goes back to the idea of labor Zionism that um, what you needed to create the state of Israel was to have um, Jews not exploiting other people, but Jews, well, Jews exploiting each other, although they pretended that wasn't what was going to happen. Um, so it has a very important role in the history of Zionism. Yes, indeed, it does. I mean, I was just uh, on this oil thing that I'm working on, I was looking it up, and Golda Meir mm-hmm. was actually enormously important. She was from the very first, like one of these so Druid figures. So, mm-hmm. uh, so, so yes, it was it was yeah. crucial in the formation and establishment of the state of Israel. Certainly in the first thirty years of it. So, right now, Israel's withholding tax money from the Palestinian Authority. Workers are being prevented from going to their jobs. Netanyahu's solution to all of this is apparently to tell the UAE to pay their impl- unemployment, um, and also imply that the other Arab states should pay for the reconstruction of Gaza. Um, Kareem, in, in an interview with The Baffler, you noted that people fear, as happened in the past, these so-called emergency closures and restrictions will become permanent. Um, how is this moment, I guess, being set up and the money being used to expand Israeli territorial claims and push responsibility for the Palestinians onto um, anybody else? I mean, on the, the question of the, the sort of withholding the, the, the tax revenues, I mean, the PA is the largest employer. So when Israel withholds the tax payments, it's often getting distributed downwards in the form of late or non-payment of people's wages. So, so I think the consequences for, you know, uh, the, the people's personal and family economics are, are, are really clear. Yeah. The entire structure is scaffolded by the PA and its relationship to Israel. I mean, I think we'll, we've said this, we'll probably keep saying it over and over again. Right. I mean, the, the idea that Arab states should pay for it is, I think, just another technology for Israel to figure out how to make its occupation sort of more stable and less costly. Mm-hmm. So, like, on the one hand, it's, it's like it's insanity yeah. to, to suggest something like that. But on the other hand, there is some truth to it because it's always Palestinians who are bearing the cost of this. Right. Right. It's always it's that's 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 how it works. I mean, on the question of the um, the 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 temporary temporary closures and things, I mean, I was referring really specifically to a couple of conversations I had had uh, right before talking to Josh for that interview 
um, with people, conversations I'd had with people in the West Bank, um, you know, and they were afraid of what was going on and how sort of life was 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 being closed in on them. Um, you know, uh, again, my 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 work and my friends and my sort of distant family are mostly in Ramallah. And so that's that's the, the the population of people that I'm mostly talking to. The life that they, that they have there is different from, you know, Tudkarum just yesterday or or where, you know, they're being bombarded and the camps are being destroyed. Um, but what they were sort of again, kind of correctly diagnosing is the the historical problem where a lot of temporary checkpoints and things like that become permanent. So yeah. small checkpoints get get built up. Uh, curfews don't go away for years. Yeah. Um, you know, things things in this process take time to establish themselves. But um, but again, I mean, I think the occupation only really goes in one direction. And 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 the other thing that you know, I was last there in June, and there was a there was a major settler attack, um, and uh, and I and I think the people are also, you know, again, correctly diagnosing the problem that you know the settler this this settler violence and settler control of of territory is not new. But the they are being sort of continuously emboldened and armed in in ways that are that are more visibly threatening to yeah. certain zones of 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 life and, and stability in the West Bank. Yeah, I want to return to the settlers in just a second, but um, I actually wanted to ask Lala because you've written very specifically about sort of the process of imprisonment and confinement in Palestine as in other places, um, and these questions of like curfews and demolishing people's houses as punishment and all of that. Um, so I just wanted to ask you to dive into that just a little bit more before we move on to the question of settlers, which I'm very ready for. I mean, from 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 the moment in which uh, a, a colonial states tried to uh, pacify anti-colonial struggle, you have had a series of technologies emerging that have been perfected in a lot of places. Um, and Palestine has actually, interestingly, even before the establishment of the State of Israel, has been at the core of this, in part because um, the uh, the centrality of Palestine to uh, the Abrahamic world religions, um, its, uh, its attachment to the Ottoman Empire at the very moment at which the Ottoman Empire was being torn apart uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the uh, First World War, and, and the importance of that part of the world um, in establishment of the different kinds of mandates of the European states that allowed for them to extend right. their colonial control in the region at the very moment in which these anti-colonial nationalist struggles were taking off. Um, so, so for all of those reasons, you had a series of technologies emerging, uh, that, and the British were perfecting a lot of these technologies, which had to do with collective punishment, destroying people's houses, building walls around people, creating permit regimes um, that, that, um, that uh, uh, allowed people to move or not move. So, so control of movement, uh, where you needed labor to do the labor, but also where you didn't want people to move, foreclosing the possibility of that. You had things like taking people hostage yeah. um, all the time. You you had people being used as mm -hmm. human shields. And uh, Nicola um, Perugini and Neve Gordon have written an entire book about this use of human shields, which, uh, which very often uh, is what colonial powers do. And all of these technologies, um, which the British... Uh, perfected in order to sort of um, uh, kind of pacify the revolt that was happening. For example, in uh, the in mid 1930s, uh, the, the the major Palestinian revolt, which happened in the countryside and then spread to the cities and, and ended up with all sorts of uh, strikes and armed struggle and all forms of um, all forms of uh, pushback. Um, these methods were perfected there. Laws were created, administrative detention laws, which the Israelis have extended and made more brutal and cruel. Um, were uh, established by the by the British in um, in Palestine in the 1920s, and then. Uh constantly revised throughout the 1930s, and then they were incorporated into Israeli law in 1948. And so what is really interesting is that since then, of course, because Israel um, has touted itself as a site of uh, perfecting these technologies of counterinsurgency and control, and in more recent times added technological 
uh, sort of benefits of that. So questions of surveillance, questions of um, uh, sort of turning people uh, on the basis of the, the, the kinds of remote uh, or, or killing people, assassinating people, surveilling people on the basis of remote controlled um, uh, automated forms, of, I, I don't know, quadcopters and drones and the like. All of these kinds of technologies and sometimes literally technologies, i.e. I, technological um, surveillance mechanisms yeah. have been used right. by Israel in various times to control various Palestinian populations. Between 1948 and 1967, this was exercised on Palestinians that were inside the Green Line, uh, who were under military um, government, essentially, uh, very similar to the one that was established in the West Bank and Gaza, sorry, until 1966, not 1967. And then from 1967 uh, onwards, uh, those same methods have been used uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories uh, and also in Golan and in Sinai until the, the uh, Israelis uh, were uh, withdrew from Sinai on the basis of the agreement that Begin reached with Sadat in Camp David. And so these methods are used everywhere. This, these forms of collective punishment, this, the destruction of people's houses, the holding of civilians responsible for the activities of militants, which has now gained a name called the Dahia Doctrine, because this is exactly what, for example, Israel did also in Lebanon, which uh, it all... It also had an occupation area. But the Dahia Doctrine also operates even in places which Israel does not occupy. In fact, that is exactly what it means, is that you go and bomb the civilians in the Dahia, uh, which means suburb, uh, areas of, um, of uh, Beirut, so that the people will turn against Hezbollah in that instance. The destruction of Palestinian civilians, for example, in Janin or Tulkarem, so that they would turn against the militants that are trying to organize against Israel there. The destruction, the complete raising of Gaza, aside from genocidal intentions yeah. that are intended to ethnically cleanse people there so that that area could be incorporated because of gas exploitation, because of routes to Egypt, because of routes to the sea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but in addition to all of that, you're also destroying the people so that they would turn against Hamas, for example. This is it's it's it is it, these are all incredibly familiar techniques that Israel has been using from the get go and continues to perfect it. And by perfecting it, mean uh, I mean making it more lethal and cruel. I mean, it's just, it's also, it's also just so foolish because I mean, yeah. the, the people, people are very aware of who's, who's destroying the infrastructure. Right. right? Not, you know. Yeah. 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 Um, it really doesn't seem to be working for them. Um, so I do want to return to the, the question of settlers. Um, so as we've noted, there are supposedly no more settlers in Gaza, although I'm sure that's about to change. Um, but the role of settlers in the West Bank in terms of expropriating land um, and this the way that this is sort of privatized violence with some level of, of Israel's plausible deniability, right? Except obviously it's done with the backing of the state. Um, yeah. So Kareem, can we get back into settlers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the plausible deniability is sort of is the right way of putting it. I mean, it should just be really obvious that there is no meaningful separation between settlers in the state or settlers in the military. Um, you know, this is something that has long been noted, studied, described. The ways that Jewish Israeli civilians in the West Bank are sort of a crucial part of how territory is controlled through their presence, through infrastructure, through the, um, the their, through their violence through the security around them and, and, and so on. Um, yeah. I mean, more recently, there has been really a huge increase in settler violence there. You yeah. know, as part, of, as part of the negotiations around forming a new government, uh, some, in Israel, a new Israeli government, some of the most far-right elements have been, have been empowered or are now in the center of the government. Right. And actual management of the West Bank has been handed over to you know, an eth ethno-nationalist, uh, Ben Gavir, who has been arming settlers. Um, so yeah, so there's huge increase in settler attacks on Palestinians, murders. Palestinians have been reporting the settlers are wearing sort of partial or complete military uniforms uh, in, in, the, in since, since October 7th. You've been seeing that a lot. Um, since October 7th, also nearly 400 Palestinians in the West Bank have been killed by the military and by settlers. I mean, I think one thing, <clears throat> you know, Lale mentioned uh, Nicola Pergini and Neve Gordon, who, uh, who have been writing about this uh, together and separately a lot. 
You know, when I was um, when I was doing the sort of the bulk of my my field work, Nicola, who's who's a friend of mine and who we've we've written together, um, both sort of separately came across this one organization called Regavim that he and Nee mm-hmm. wrote about. Um, you know, yeah. uh, Weitzman and 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 many people have written about Regavim. Um, yeah. But one of the things that's important is that uh, to that that we sort of realized when we were researching them and when we did one interview with a Regavim person is that. Um, you know, 2005, the, the Gaza pullout was like a real moment of trauma for these settlers. It was it was a it was a galvanizing moment um, and was uh, sort of like a central organizing principle for a lot of the really right wing elements in the in the West Bank. And they had organizations like like Regabim and others that then that have now given people into the center of the government. Now, I, I think that there has always been like a pro transfer strand uh, in in Israel and in the Israeli government, the issue is now is that some of these people are now are, are you know now have portfolios, right? And 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 so so like so the West Bank and 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 Gaza are really linked because, you know they, some of these people look at look at what's happening now is like their opportunity for return, their opportunity for redressing these wrongs. I think you can trace out the 2005 stuff in mm-hmm. the legal reforms, because one of the things that Regavim d- did, um, Nicole and I wrote about this together, and then he, he did much more of this work separately. Um, one of the things they've, they've been doing is, is sort of attacking the, um, the high court in Israel because it has this sort of reputation as being liberal or, or mm. the, right. maintaining the rule of law or whatever. <laughs> But so they 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 maintain they they they're attacking it sort of explicitly, but also through mechanisms like trying to clutter it up with all these cases where they invert basically the proper nouns of of legal filings by you know anti occupation NGOs, and so they have this whole now body of of claims about how you know uh, Israelis are being discriminated against on the basis of their Jewishness, on the basis of their national claims, things like that. Um, but I think that that's 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 really sort of important to keep in mind because they're attacking. The sort of the foundation of of law and legal practice within Israel, they're attacking the sort of possibilities for Palestinian life and existence in the West Bank, and now they're trying to return to Gaza. You know, they're trying to the, they're they're trying to 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 clear it and return to it. You know, and you yeah. see this. I you know we don't know how this is going to end up, but you know you can see on on all the all the really grotesque stuff on social media. You know the the. Mm-hmm. Set, the Pardon me, the soldiers who are putting up like fake pizza restaurants and and you know I'll, I'll be back here on the beach in, in a year with with my with my partner and things like. I that. mean, it's also yeah. really important yeah. to note yeah. that even before these kinds of vicious, particularly vicious guys, the Regavim guys or the, the guys in Kiryat Arba, they, there are also plans. The settlements were not entirely intended to be for these kind of a rabbit frothing at the mouth kind of characters. Right. Settlements right. have always right. been part of the broader uh, the, the process of establishing of a settler colony. I mean, inside the Green Line, the Israelis set up development towns all around the borders and then populated them with the unwanted or less wanted uh, Mm -hmm. Mizrahi immigrants uh, from Yemen and Iraq and other places so that they could be on the one hand uh, forming a kind of a front line against Palestinians trying to come back to, for example, work on their own lands, um, which happened uh, with a great frequency until the late 1950s. Um, And and they were essentially using these development towns, uh, which were settlements, uh, as as a model, as, as a kind of a... I guess the best word that I can use is, is as human shields, as civilian shields for the state of Israel. Because always, because because yeah. the other thing that people I think need to recognize um, is that the state of Israel yeah. might use its own civilians in well in, in its Hasbara, but actually what it really cares about is, is its soldiers. So it doesn't ma- mind its right. civilians being cannon fodder, but its soldiers cannot die. It's, and particularly the, the not the conscripts, but the ones that have been trained and our professional soldiers, they absolutely matter a lot for them. And part of the viciousness of the response right now, part of the sort of the genocidal intent is precisely because of the number of soldiers that were killed on the 7th of October and the days following it. And I think that that also plays itself out in the in the establishment of these settlements and the militarization of certain yeah. settlers. Um, self-militarization, yeah. but also this kind of a liminal space between being a civilian and being a military, not quite exactly the military. They are a kind of a human shield for the state of Israel. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I we've seen that play out a little bit with the the hostages from October seventh, right? That like the government seems to have absolutely no interest yeah. in getting them. No, I think it's and they are coming from these development towns. Yeah, that that's exactly what it is, and I think that it is the hostages are used as a, a kind of an uh, again as a as an excuse, and obviously it's been extremely successful Hasbara because whenever you talk to anybody, they are like, oh, the hostages must come home first. But it has been fascinating for me that actually when it comes, you know, they shoot at the hostages, they flood the the tunnels yep. uh, with uh, with gas, knowing that the, there are hostages kept there. So so in a way, it is again it, the state of Israel the. the protection of the state is more important than the protection of civilians as as counterintuitive as that sounds um the, and the civilians are very often its own civilians i'm not even talking about palestinian civilians its own civilians yeah, are also right. uh the, the human shield that they use in fighting against whoever yeah I, I i just i think that's exactly the right way of putting it that the 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 maintenance of the state is more more important than the sort of the, the protection or the maintenance of civilians and and also i think points towards the 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 question you asked, which is how are how are all these things linked? Which is that even civilians who who are just you know living in places where they're living are part of the sort of the wider state process here. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And are you know, human shields, as Lolly put it, I think yeah. is right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, to sort of invert this question almost, Kareem, in, in your book, which I recommend everyone read, um, you write about the opening to private investment in the West Bank, um, the idea that, quote, Palestine could build a private economy and that subsequently, eventually, a functioning and free state would emerge. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about this turn towards sort of state without a state, neoliberal development. Yeah, I mean, the idea that was sort of really promoted and, and worked out in the aftermath of the 2006 elections and the Fatah and Hamas split was that the PA in the West Bank could, through economic means and private development, create a functional economy with an eventual state to come sometime later. So that was really, I think, embedded within the kinds of temporary security measures that we're talking about, the wider context and reality of political instability. And the idea was that the PA would lay the foundations for something like a day after uh, but one that was perpetually deferred. Um, I think it was it was a pretty new conciliatory, conciliatory approach um, and one that I, I think obviously did not succeed. Um, and so, like, I'm skeptical, but one thing to make clear also is that um, a lot of Palestinians that I talked to who are not just liberals, but also sort of people outside the major cities um, were in favor of it for the simple reason that it was the first time that they actually saw the PA actually doing something or working toward, no, no, really. Yeah, like really. working working on their behalf uh, mm -hmm. through like material things like small infrastructure projects and, and, yeah. and, and stuff like that. Um, and and so, you know, that the idea was that they could sort of build up something like a zone of stability and then we had this state thing that would that would come later. Um, you know, my goal in, in talking about it was to uncover and to diagnose some of the problems um, and to try to see how it shook out through things like what I what I study, you know, mortgages, stabilization, changes in yeah. land tenure, things like that. Um, yeah. But it, it, you know, sort of a key point here that I think links it links it back to our discussion is that, like, I, I think that this is in part about sort of stabilization mechanisms. I think it's really precarious, um, and I think if 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 we think about how how Gaza and the West Bank are linked, um, this kind of project, which of real estate development and stuff like that, which is narrowly focused around Ramallah in the, in the hopes that it's a model that can be applied elsewhere is really about creating zones of safety, safety and stability at the expense of the violence that Palestinians face mm. in Gaza, in other parts of the West Bank, in other parts yeah. of historic Palestine. And I, 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 I don't want to make like too, too clear a link between it, but you hear a lot about, um, you know, zones of stability in Gaza, leave the North yeah. and you'll be fine. You know, this, right. uh, who's, mm -hmm. the, who's the really repulsive, um, Maybe that doesn't uh, so, narrow it down at all. No, the 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 State Department um, press conference. Kirby, guy. Uh, you know he, yeah, he's been he's been Ugh. talking about about deconfliction zones, right? And um and I think that you know, I think that that if I if I try to sort of think about the broader processes, you know, one of the ways that the real estate development I think worked was to try to create sort of sites and opportunities for stability and pacification and some kind of a normal life, some kind of a permissible Palestinian life within Palestine through economic mechanisms, right? Yeah. Again, we have solving the political problems, not through politics, but through humanitarianism or right. through 
you know, accumulation for those who are sort of capable and empowered to accumulate and things like that. So the, 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 the ways that the, the fragmentation links together with the, you know, or with the organizing principle being like, eventually we'll get there when yeah. that seems pretty unlikely. Yeah. 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 I mean, there were so many striking things in the book. Like I said, I really recommend everyone read it. Um, one developer saying there are returns to be made here when obviously when we think about return in terms of Palestine, we mean the right to return home. Um, the way the rhetoric around this private housing development and mortgage debt echoes Margaret Thatcher and the sell off of social housing in Britain. Um and the way that these middle class housing developments and this sort of pushing people into the sort of nuclear family apartment, right, um, is very different from the traditional style of home and land ownership. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, the way that this is pushing people into a particular kind of home ownership structure that um, is counter to the way Palestinians had traditionally understood home and land ownership. You know, that was such a jarring statement uh, yeah. when I when I heard that guy say that. So I was I was at the second Palestinian investment conference at the big uh, Palest at the big uh, what's it called cultural center conference center in Bethlehem. Um, and you know I saw like the Palestinian bourgeoisie. Uh, George Mitchell was there, who is now uh, oh yes most recently in the news for his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. Um, I saw I saw Tony Blair there. Um, and and uh, it was it was just days after the Isra after Israel had murdered nine activists on the Mavi Marmara the um, the Turkish oh, right. ship God, that was yeah. uh, attempting to break the the naval blockade of Gaza and um, you know there was some yeah. discussion of canceling or postponing the conference ultimately what ended up was there were flags at, at half mast um, and you know when that guy said that you know one thing I tried to do was to take what people were saying really seriously like my politics are different of course. Um, but I, I wanted to take what they were saying seriously, not just to sort of to, 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 to judge it, but to try to understand the, the politics that are applied and the sort of like the kinds of organizing and thinking that they're doing. Um, because what's what's interesting about them is that many of those Palestinian capitalists do see what they're doing as part of a nationalist responsibility to Palestine. So that's yeah. what that was about. He mm -hmm. was saying like, you know. You know, maybe some of them are cynical, but not all of them. And 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 what he was saying is like, this is our responsibility as people who can do this to return our capital, to return our businesses to Palestine as part of this sort of like economic economic buildup in in en route to a state. You know, so like the state building approach, I mean, it only makes sense in 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 the context of a total incapacity to do politics or resistance. Um, you know, and and so. So I wanted to try to, to, to understand the combination of politics and accumulation and national investment that was, that was, that was happening through, through, through projects like that. I mean, on the, the question of ownership structure, I mean, that is something that, the, that, that real estate developers talk about. So on the one hand, they talk about, you know, our real estate developments can be for Palestine. We can build up a, a nice, stable living environment. Um, we can, we can be a territorial block in similar ways that settlements are territorial blocks. They do, they do say things like that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, like, I, I, I'm not willing to just say that that's, that's bogus. You know, I mean, yeah. I think that that's, that's part of how they're organizing their, you know, their imperatives for accumulation. Yeah. Um, uh, but one of the things as, 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 as you ask about is like, they do need to kind of engineer a middle class or a middle class buying pool through things like new mortgage mechanisms, through ideas that 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 people should or could want uh, new single family homes, and so they're 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 creating you know through uh, through forms of aid that comes from USAID and and OPIC uh, new sort of uh, like, yeah like mechanisms for mortgages to bring people in to drive down housing costs. Also, because in the absence of sort of politics or a national nationalist kind of economic practice, they're doing it through private through private mechanisms. They're doing it through private development. They're not doing it through you know public housing or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so right. So when we talk about the Middle East broadly, we often talk about oil. 
Um, there has been discussion of natural gas off of Gaza um, and that being a possible motivation for all of this happening right now. Um, and then, of course, the U.S. and the U.K. are excited about bombing um, Yemen because the Houthis are disrupting shipping. Um, so, Lala, I want to talk a little bit more about oil and the importance of shipping through the Red Sea in this particular moment. Um, okay, so the oil thing is really interesting because uh, obviously uh, the, the Red Sea is one of the biggest uh, points of uh, the movement of oil from uh, the Gulf to the um, to Europe, but also interestingly from the Black Sea through the Mediterranean, uh, sort of uh, Central Asia, through the Mediterranean down towards Asia. So it actually oil travels in both directions there. Um, and one of the things that's also significant is that uh, there's, a, there's a particular pipeline in Israel uh, called the Eilat Ashkelon line, which uh, actually provides, um, it, it's uh, a, a pipeline that a lot of, if, until the revolution, the Shah of Iran used to send oil through, some of it for Israeli consumption, some of it went to Ashkelon and got onto ships and was sent out to Europe. Um, but now it's the United Arab Emirates that actually supplies that pipeline. It has, has made deals since the Abraham Accords and does that. So that is um, one of the things that Houthis are trying to disrupt. The other element uh, about this, which uh, is, again, sort of uh, vulgar economic uh, reasons, is that indeed the question of energy is really important. Um, uh, Israel is very energy poor, uh, and uh, until and until uh, the uh, uh, Iranian revolution, it, uh, it, the, the Shah of Iran used to provide its energy needs. Um, of course, it needed energy because it needed to, do, to have desalination plants in order to water its agricultural projects. It needed energy in order to create electricity. It needed energy um, eventually when, when the economy shifted, uh, flipped over to industrial. Uh, it needed energy for its industries. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it's when, when the Shah of Iran was overthrown by the revolution, one of the interesting things that we see is a tightening of the relationship between Israel and South Africa, uh, with South Africa providing coal to Israel. So in fact, Israel did not have any coal burning plants until um, just about around the time of the revolution. And it established the coal burning plants because it yeah. was sure of apartheid South Africa providing it with coal. Today, um, Israel's energy needs are met 70% by natural gas fields that have been discovered off the, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, particularly Tamar and Leviathan fields, some of which is then exported from there. Um, and set 30% by coal burning plants, which uh, is provided now, I think, primarily by uh, India, Australia, and the United States. So, um, so what's is significant about this is that in addition to, Tam uh, to Tamar and Leviathan fields, which fall within uh, Israeli national waters, there's also a massive uh, gas field that was that was uh, d discovered in uh, the late 2000s uh, by British Gas, um, and that is called the Gaza the Gaza gas field, um, and it is literally off the coast of Gaza. I mean, you can if if they had rigs there, you would be able to see it from land. As it is, you can actually see the Tamar um, field rigs from Gaza on a clear, non-hazy day. Um, but, uh, but the Gaza gas fields, the moment that they were discovered, it, it, it is really interesting, the synchronicity between the, the further closures and the narrowing down of Gazans' access to their own water and the discovery of this gas field. That, I mean, it is entirely deliberate. They may use some half-assed excuse about it being security region, uh, reasons, but it, specifically the moment that this gas field is um, discovered, uh, Gazan's access to it uh, is uh, limited. So the Gazan access to water goes from being 12 miles off the coast to six miles to three miles, and then once the gas fields are discovered, it is reduced to one. Um, uh, so, so, so essentially, they can't go out into to, to do any kind of exploration. Um, and now, uh, a, a couple of weeks after the 7th of October, uh, uh, Netanyahu actually licensed exploitation of those gas fields, um, which it has by rights of occupation, by no nobody's legal uh, definition, including the State Department's, it has does not have the right to license those lands and yeah, to to license those fields, and yet it has done so. So I think that it's there are 
it, I am going to sound like one of these old uh, uncles conspiracy theorizing about oil, but it, but the extent to which Israel is dependent on natural gas, the extent to which uh, this uh, the discovery uh, uh, and licensing of this natural gas fits its programs of de-developing Palestinians and and denying them access to their own resources. I mean, this is classic settler colonialism. It's really, there, there really is nothing else that, um, that can explain it other than the old uncle conspiracy theories. Um, the fact is, it's not a conspiracy theory. The fact is, we can actually see these. And as I said, we can see the synchronicity between the different kinds of security plans that Israel establishes around Gaza and with Palestinians um, and, uh, and, and the discovery of these natural resources that could potentially be used to develop Palestinian economy in whatever f- shape or form that it might take. Yeah. So um, the the Suez Canal has been closed before due to Israel's wars. Um, but tell us a little bit briefly about like, who are the Houthis? What are they doing? And what are the odds that the US and Britain can actually bomb them into submission, considering they've been being bombed for quite a while now and haven't submitted? So um, Houthis are uh, Zaydis, um, and uh, the, the Zaydis are a specific sort of a sect that um, is uh, primarily present in what used to be North Yemen. So, so the bit of Yemen that is on the Red Sea rather than on the Gulf of Aden. Um, and the Zaydis uh, um, have often chaff, uh, chafed against um, kind of uh, control uh, is, uh, of other sects over them. There's also uh, political struggles uh, that have happened over in, in Yemen over uh sort of the control of the government there. And when the Yemeni government in in the wake of Ali Abdullah Saleh being overthrown by the Arab uprising aligned itself with Saudi Arabia, the Zaydis felt... um, quite uncomfortable about that. They, they felt quite, um, they, they, they felt put upon. And so they engaged in an insurgency against the government that had aligned itself with Saudi Arabia. That translated, I'm, I'm, I'm doing an extra, I'm doing huge violence to this yes, history. Of I recommend Helen Lackner, if anybody wants to read about this. Uh, she's, she's amazing on Yemen. Um, and then uh, in 2015, uh, Saudi Arabia wanted uh, safety in its quote unquote backyard. And therefore, it, uh, it, along with its allies, particularly the United Arab Emirates and others, it waged the war against um, Ansar Allah, the, the Houthi organization that was there. Now, when that started happening, the Ansar Allah looked for external support. And, and so they formed an alliance with Iran. It, I think it's really important. They're often said to be Iran's clients in the region. Their, their history is far more complex than to them simply being a kind of a direct proxy. They have ve- their own very specific political um, and cultural interests and social interests inside Yemen, which, of course, clashes with, uh, with other communities um, within Yemen. And there's all sorts of um, internal st- struggles uh, between the Houthis and other groups um, there. And so, for example, in South Yemen, you, you will find separatist groups also that don't want to have anything to do with the Houthis. There are divisions that have there are fissures that have been widened by the 2011 uprising. These fissures existed long before that, but they've been widened by the 2011 uprising and by the, conse- uh, by the subsequent um, Saudi uh, and Emirati intervention in Yemen. Now, the uh, Saudi Emirati intervention in Yemen w- was an abject failure. The Emiratis pulled out um, before the Saudis as long as they could control uh, an island called Sogotra, which sits um, at, on the entrance to the Bab al Mandab, uh, which is what they do control. And I should say it's not all Emiratis. It's Abu Dhabi that actually does this. It's Abu Dhabi is like sort of the muscle in um, United Arab Emirates. However, the United Arab Emirates very happily allows Dubai Ports World to lay claim, for example, to the Port of Aden. The Houthis control San'a and they control the Port of Hodeida, which sits on the Red Sea. And so they have occasionally used their control over the Red Sea as a means of expressing uh, their military presence in that region. And and in particular, they have begun to do so uh, in support of Palestinians in Gaza since um, since the Israeli genocide, the genocidal action there has begun. Now, this has been particularly 
particularly interesting because Iran doesn't want a full on fight. I think that uh, the Iranians mm -hmm. are very aware that as the in an election year with all of the conflict that is going on and with actual unpopularity of their regime, they cannot risk um, having external wars. And so, for example, you see that in response to the bombings during the anniversary of um, uh, the, the general's funeral in Kerman, the, the response wasn't to blame the US or Israel. The response was to go bomb Pakistan, mm -hmm. which is all, itself another clusterfuck. Um, but, uh, yes. in, in effect, saying that they think that it is separatists, uh, Islamist separatists in, in, um, Af uh, in Pakistan that are responsible for that bombing. So they are trying to de-escalate. It also seems to me that Hezbollah has been quite quiet in the northern borders. They have engaged in some skirmishes with the Israeli state, but relative to what they they are, I, I should say, capable of. They have been quite quiet. And so what has been fascinating has been the Houthi activities in Bab al-Mandab. Because what they did, what they began by doing was to actually by bringing ships to berth, uh, particularly a big vehicle carrier, and saying that you're not allowed to go to... Um, Israel or attacking ships that are heading towards Israel. Of course, it's very easy to see where ships are going. Most of us can do so now because there are, God knows there are all sorts of apps that are available. And if you pay uh, the subscription fee, you can exactly, you can see not only what is on, you know, where the ship is going, but also what's on the ship. And so the Houthis began start, started to specifically attack the ships that were going to Israel. And this has been an extraordinary political feat because now either ships are that are going to Israel and or since the US and UK began their attacks to US or UK, have to reroute around the Cape of Good Hope, or as is the case with the Chinese and East Asian and Southeast Asian uh, ships, they are now beginning to have a handle in their automatic um, identification uh, uh, thing that says that they, uh, the ship does not touch Israel, which is, which is extraordinary because political, is if pi political isolation of Israel was an aim of this, this has been probably alongside the South yeah. African case, the most successful instance of activity of isolating mm -hmm. um, uh, Israel politically, um, which is part of the reason why the US and the UK um, and, and a bunch of smaller countries that God knows what, why they're doing it. Uh, actually, most of them are shipping countries. Um, uh, they uh, have sort of declared Operation Prosperity Guardian. But I have to say that I genuinely think that even the United States military, despite all of their bluster, is probably not particularly happy about going to another war in, in the region, in part because that would be a war against Iran. And Iran's military, even if Iran's regime is unstable, the moment somebody attacks Iran, Iranians usually, uh, the, the, the nationalist fervor wins over whatever political disagreements. Mm -hmm. um, and also their military is not some, you know, that it, it, it is a, it's a well-experienced mm -hmm. military. And so the, the U.S. military doesn't want to go to war against Iran. And so it is going to attack Houthis. It is going to kill Houthis. Uh, it is going to bomb even places in Sana'a, but it is, uh, it, 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 to me, it's a lot of what they're doing is actually performative. In part also because they are so completely mm -hmm. helpless uh, in, in doing, uh, in, for example, affecting the Chinese shippers from declaring that they're not touching Israel or from stopping actually mm -hmm. insurance companies from saying they're not going to insure US, UK or Israeli ships going through the Red Sea. That the these this, these are not yeah. Houthi insurance companies. This is these are the big reinsurers yeah. sitting in London and New York. And so I think that this has been yeah. the particular uh, the the particular effect, the political effect of the Houthi activities has been that it has been particularly successful mm -hmm. in in showing that everything is connected in this particular way, and that they are going to make a political stand uh, despite the fact that uh, the, the U.S. is engaged in this particular way in response. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that brings me to my sort of last couple of questions, which are about um, these broader economic interventions that are happening elsewhere in the world. On top of the existing boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, um, there have been actions targeting weapons manufacturers in the U.S. and, and England. Um, there are tech workers organizing at Amazon and Google under the banner of No Tech for Apartheid, trying to get those companies to break their deals with Israel. 
Um, there are people shutting down traffic to major cities, obviously. Um, but where do you think these kinds of disruption tactics have been or could be the most successful um, and have a chance of actually affecting the war machine? Uh, I mean, I think that uh, for years and years and years, uh, union organization, radical unions, for example, in Genova or in Barcelona or in South Africa, um, uh, among the shippers have, for example, refused to um, unload. Uh, and you also had, you know, stop the boat in California uh, or in the yeah. whole of the West yeah. Coast. Um, and, and yeah, yeah and, and, and in those instances, well, and what's interesting about those is that in the U.S. it was actually community organizations to, to, to push the union mm -hmm. into that, whereas in in some of these mm -hmm. other places that I mentioned, the unions are actually really quite radical. So I think I think that um, concerted action in unions is I I enormously important. I do think also that the kinds of activities that we're seeing from states is uh, is crucial. I do, for example, Malaysia announced that it wasn't going to be allowing for uh, Israeli ships to refuel there. And, and that's an, an enormously important um, uh, action, in part because Malaysia sits astride the, you know, the Malacca Straits, which 30% which of global shipping goes through. I mean, 30%. That's a huge amount. And so to, for, for Malaysia to say that they weren't, they're, they're not going to allow refueling in Malaysian ports for Israeli ships is actually quite a big deal. That said, there are also things happening on the other side, which I think we should mention and which I think we should watch out for. So one of the things that has happened with Israel not having access, so such an easy access to uh, to Palestinian labor from West Bank and Gaza, uh, arresting, detaining um, thousands of them and, and also revoking permits, is that, of course, a lot of the uh, low, lower wage Israeli jobs are going unfilled. Uh, and in places where, for example, Jordanians or Egyptians are doing some of that labor, um, Israelis uh, are showing sort of racist apprehension about Arabs doing um, the, the, those kinds of wage labor and tourist resorts, et cetera, et cetera. And so Israel has started to sign deals, memoranda of understanding with Asian and Southeast Asian countries to bring in masses of laborers, um, and in particular with India. And I think that this is actually something that we should watch out for. I mean, what is really fascinating is that Israel is, you know, it, it does have these particular massive labor needs in, in the lower wage market. And how is it going to control these wage bills um, if it's not going to be the Palestinians that are subjected to permit regime? It is going to be essentially the same kind of migrant worker regime that has been so successful in allowing the countries of the Gulf to accumulate capital at the expense of these deportable, exploitable workers. And, and Israel is shifting in that direction. Something really fascinating to watch out for. Yeah. Karim? Yeah, I mean, and Israel has also tried that before. And it is, and it is, it is sort of caused social problems. I mean, it, it's caused sort of yeah social and political problems in the context of a, a state that is it is a racist state, right? I mean, I think that like what these things have in common that you're you're talking about, you know, the tech workers, BDS, the sort of blockades. I think what what they all have in common is is that they are tactics that really are premised on sort of global connection in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if the question is about, you know, sort of like the transport unions and Palestine action, I mean, I have, uh, you know, I, I think what they're doing is, is really heroic and principled, you know, putting themselves and their families at, at risk, but doing it against, you know, not just doing it to make a claim, but, you know, against war and against war profiteering in general. You yeah. know, I, I, think the same is, I think the same is true of, you know, BDS has had a lot of, really high profile successes as a tactic and, and a container for solidarity activism. It's been powerful economically, uh, but also materially in terms of organizing, rhetorically in terms of bringing moral and political claims into people's everyday sort of parlance, right? Um, it's important for bringing people into the cause and into the struggle. I think, uh, I think that can't be overstated. And so the reason that there are crackdowns um, aren't just because they're successful in, in harming companies, but because the claims are about sort of, again, these worldwide connections and the complicities in business and in culture and so on. So, I mean, I was I was texting with my mom the other day about South Africa and, and the ICJ, and she was on her way to the South African embassy for, for like a, a sort of a block party celebration, um, solidarity in Palestine and also with, with South Africa. And she reminded me of the last time that we were there uh, when I was a kid. And she was saying that there was the she she mentioned the chant no guns no aid no business no trade right like people have known this for a long time 
right? People, people, people understand how these things are all bound and touch our lives. And I think BDS and sort of, you know, blocking ships, trying to shut down arms manufacturers, these, these are like very direct routes into making the case clear for people outside of Palestine and giving them a way in. Um, and also, at least in, you know, in this country where I, where I live and where I grew up, um, you know, making very direct claims about the foundational support for Israel um, is a part of that. The foundational support within America for for for, for Israel. Um, I think on the on the tech worker thing, you know, like I I I I find myself sometimes kind of confused by the literature on the the sort of the the, the technologies of of Israel and the occupation. And so the first thing to say is that you know Lale earlier was talking about the techniques of permit regimes, closures, the the sort of the um, making the the comparison between other. Uh, settler colonial context, like that's, that's the first thing. Those are also technologies of control, yeah. right? And so, so broadening it out, I think is important because I remember the, you know, the first time I went to Palestine for research, I was really influenced by a lot of work that emphasized the like the, the technology aspect, the technological aspects of, of this control. And then you get there and it's just this piecemeal thing, you know, it's, it's, it's teenagers just looking at Facebook and occasionally looking at the person that they're, they're trying to wave through a checkpoint or, or, you know, occasionally being bothered. Um, and I think that like, you know, you get the same questions over and over again at the airport. And so it's not just a technologically sophisticated form of management or like a Gattaca situation. Um, because it's also, you know, I mean, I'm not a technologic technology person, but I mean, I think we can start to guess like it's a massive scale problem. It's a massive data mining problem. Um, and so, so I think it's important to, to, to sort of see how these things are not just abstract, that like, you know, surveillance technology with computers and cameras and stuff is in the same lineage as, you know, permit regimes and looking at, looking at people's papers, you know, because it is always backed by implicit and explicit violence. The violence is always there. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I guess, you know, I think the idea of it being this technologically sophisticated thing uh, I said something like this in that in that 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 Balfour thing, like it justifies the overwhelming and indiscriminate force that Israel can and has brought to bear on Palestinians mm -hmm. with the sort of idea that it's it's technologically sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, second, I think back to the sort of the connections piece, like the massive importance of the military to Israel's political economy, but also its society and culture. Uh, means that it's generating research and development on military technologies that can be exported or can be brought into consumer technologies. And so then the tech activism that you're talking about is really important in, in sort of in, in making those, those cases um, because it points directly to how civil and military and accumulation are all intertwined. And it, it is a real pressure point because of the way that they're, they're, they're intertwined. So, yeah. so I, I think it's all those things. Just yesterday, I got Lowenstein's book in the mail. Um, so I will, I will read it. Can I just say one thing? Your mom is very cool, yeah. Karim. <laughs> she took, she took <laughs> you, she took you when you were a kid to protest and she now goes to block parties yeah. in South Africa. Good honor. She sounds awesome. You know, the reason the reason she mentioned it, Sarah knows this. The reason she yeah. mentioned it is because she was making fun of me because I was a little kid and I misheard it or misunderstood. So I was chanting "No gum, no cake, <laughs> no, gum no cake." Oh, that's, that's so that's cute. Why, so <laughs> that's that's why. She okay. It to me, yeah. I think yeah. we should leave it with Kareem's mom being really cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> That was our episode. We had a really fascinating conversation, I think, about what it's like to try to work and exist and be a functional human being under a repressive settler colonial regime. Um, I hope you enjoyed our very first Macrodose Roundtable. We have lots more coming up soon, including another one with me featuring Quinn Slobodian and Brett Scott. And you can let us know your thoughts, questions, and ideas for future roundtables in the comments. Thank you, as always, and solidarity forever.